Hi, I'm Jiska and in this talk I'm going to show you how to interact with iOS and macOS hardware from user space. I will cover various practical examples which will help you to understand complex daemon and system internals in general. My user story to this talk is as follows. I'm a hardware hacker, mainly working on wireless chips such as Bluetooth or ultra wideband. And ironically, this is the reason why I'm buying iPhones, because this enables me to break the most recent chips. So even though this is not my main expertise, I now need to deal with iOS on a daily basis. You might wonder why I'm not just buying development kits. The weird thing is that a lot of development kits lag behind. Features are typically implemented for the big customers like Apple and Samsung in the mobile phone market. The features and chip they get are typically not available as development kit for everyone. The iPhone is released a bit later than the Samsung phones every year and usually has a slightly newer chip. The dates printed here are the ROM build date of the Bluetooth firmware and it roughly takes one year from building it to shipping the devices. Other chip dates might vary. In contrast, if you would buy an up-to-date Raspberry Pi, the Bluetooth chip ROM is still stuck in 2014. There's a lot of wireless hardware in an iPhone. Wi-Fi, Bluetooth and baseband are the obvious ones, but it also has an NFC chip and an ultra wideband chip. So if I deal with all the hassle that comes with jailbreaking iPhones, I can access quite a lot of recent hardware. After watching this talk, you will be able to find chip interfaces, find protocol handlers, maybe even decode proprietary protocols and inject custom payloads to interact with hardware or fast components. User space is quite far away from the hardware. However, it is a great approach to start there. For example, ComCenter is the wireless daemon responsible for the basement chip. It already initializes the basement chip correctly during startup. It parses incoming phone calls and SMS and replies to all the requests of the chip. It even parses chip crash logs in the case the basement chip crashes. This means that if we manage to instrument the basement chip via ComCenter, we do not have to know most basement chip internals because everything is already implemented. And finally, Frida, the tool that we are going to use later on, only supports user space. The things we are going to analyze are very similar on iOS and macOS. So even though I'm only discussing iOS in the following, the approaches will also work on macOS. A lot of this talk has been inspired by Jonathan's book. So if you want to dig a bit deeper, I can recommend to you buying it. Before we instrument anything, we need to talk about debugging and understanding existing implementations. Apple offers special profiles even for non-jailbroken devices. And after installing a profile, you will get additional logging information and sometimes even additional tool support like the Bluetooth packet logger. Sooner or later, you will be in the situation that there is no profile for what you want to debug. However, most profiles only override logging settings which you can do on your own on a jailbroken device. Here you can see the ComCenter output for the ARA protocol, which is used to interact with the basement chip. After installing the basement profile or changing the logging settings, you will see the raw packets in binary in the log. Note that you can also see the library libari, which is parsing these packets behind the name ComCenter of the daemon. Let's take a look into the iDevices log output of the ComCenter daemon, which is responsible for the baseband. So currently the iPhone is idle, so it's not sending too many things here, um, but you can see from time to time it's sending packets. And because it's including the debug log option, you can also see the raw packet bytes here. You can see that it's the ComCenter, it's parsing things with the libari. And if something is not parsed by library uh, or processed by library, then it's just the daemon name here. Now I'm going to unlock the iPhone that you can see that usually there is much more happening um, in here. So a lot of things scroll through and uh, yeah, you could see a lot of things happening. Shared libraries are very important for debugging. They are meant to be called externally and because of this, they export function names. You can extract the shared libraries using Xcode and the separate single library file format is then also supported by free tools like Yitra. A lot of low-level hardware access is implemented in shared libraries. And not just this, 
Also, packet parsing is often performed by them. So if you are lucky, you can use them to fully reconstruct proprietary protocols. So for example, Tobias just built a Wireshark sector for the RE baseband protocol based on this. This example here shows the IOKit library in IDA. You can see function names and definitions. While IOKit is documented, there are also a lot of undocumented libraries. And yeah, this is a NIDA screenshot, but you can also analyze shared libraries with Gitra. After connecting your iPhone to Xcode, you will have the iOS debug server on it, which you can repurpose to attach it to system daemons. You can either debug with LLDB or attach the IDA Pro debugger. However, LLDB is not intuitive to use and probably not everyone has a recent IDA Pro license. So this is not what we are going to use here. Instead, we will be using Frida. Rumors say that it would be short for free either. In the following, we will write a few lines of JavaScript to interact with wireless hardware. This will be very beginner-friendly compared to other wireless security research tooling. Frida does some magic to inject code into an iOS target process. You can simply program it using JavaScript. Since JavaScript is a bit limited if you don't load a lot of libraries, you can also interact with the script running on the iPhone using Python. But take care, this interaction usually has a negative performance impact. For the first example, you don't even need to write code. After installing Frida on the jbroken iPhone and your local machine, which can be macOS or Linux, you can run tools like Frida Trace. Using the parameter minus u means that you can run it on a remote USB device. Decorate will add library names and minus e includes all functions that start with objective C message. So let's take a look into Com Center. You can see that a lot of objective C message sent is going on here and the foundation framework is being used. You can also see a color change whenever there is a thread change. So you can see the ID um, and then again, the changes in between. So this was very, very fast, but if we do the same thing for a more complex protocol, this will take a while. So for example, if you want to trace the ARI protocol calls, the issue here is that all handlers will be instrumented and this will take really, really long just to instrument all of them. So I just won't do this here. There are a few things that enable super fast development with Frida. So first you can edit a script in an editor while it is already running. And every time you save it, Frida will reload it and execute it. If you design your script properly, this can be super useful. Next, the console you get the output in can also be used for live scripting in parallel and it has auto-completion. So you can define functions in your script, such as the one to reset a chip and then call it from the console whenever you need it. For me, this is the setup that I'm using, but I also linked a video below that uses the Chrome Dev tools for Frida development. Based on export in shared libraries, you can build scripts that will work across multiple iOS releases, like this example for IOKit. You can attach the interceptor to function entries and exits. Typically, you will use this to analyze or change function arguments. And either change arguments via the args, or you can also access them directly via registers. Frida is aware of symbols in shared libraries and also can access the backtrace of the current thread. This can be combined to obtain a human readable backtrace of a thread such that you can determine how a function was called. In the opposite direction, there is the stalker. This is one of the really, really fancy features in Frida. The stalker rewrites code during runtime to trace its execution. You can change the granularity. For example, you can only trace function calls or even basic blocks. A basic block would be every time you have a nonlinear decision in the program, such as an if-else statement. And using this, you will precisely know which code was executed. This is useful for debugging, but also for coverage-guided fuzzing. You can even load such coverage maps into Ghidra or IDA. Note that the stalker only works within one thread as of now. And now to one of my guilty pleasures. I love running Frida and the iOS debugger with IDA in parallel. It enables me to set breakpoints and check if something I injected with Frida is the same as what I get during regular execution while looking at decompiled code instead of assembly.
When iOS interacts with hardware, it exchanges data. And this is what we want to locate, intercept and manipulate. When I started reverse engineering wireless daemons, I just attached IDA Pro to the iOS debug server, made a lot of traffic, passed the daemon a few times, and checked if I could figure out which data was processed where just by staring at it. Overall, this works, but it is very time consuming and no fast generic approach. So let's take a more coordinated look at how to locate data. A process runs threads. A thread can spawn another thread using Grand Central Dispatch. A process can interact with another process using cross-process communication. The other process will also have threads, and one of these would parse the data that arrives via XPC. For interaction with drivers, one typical approach is using the IOKit shared library. And this library can create a user client to access according functions in the kernel. The kernel then interacts with the according hardware. This is just the bigger picture, and we will now take a closer look into all of this. Let's start with Grand Central Dispatch. Grand Central Dispatch is Apple's implementation of threading. The library for this is open source. Even though Grand Central Dispatch is only used within a process, thread switches often happen for data processing. For example, when data arrives from another process or from the kernel, this is often handed over to another thread for processing. So understanding Grand Central Dispatch will help us to find hardware-related protocol handlers. In most cases, threads are created using the dispatch async function. This function only takes two arguments, a dispatch queue, and a block that is to be executed. We can use a simple script to hook functions in libdispatch, print these queue names, and also make a backtrace. This way, we will be able to see thread switches and the overall execution in our target. While this still all sounds super theoretical, this is really, really helpful for finding interesting functions. For example, the array protocol processing starts in the function array host RT inbound message callback. And as you will see next, this can be found using libdispatch analysis tools. In Com Center, you will get a lot of output with the script. It can happen that some of the prints are out of order, but within a few seconds, we will also find the inbound message callback in the backtrace. Let's try this. You can see that there's a lot of output, um, but we can now scroll back a little bit. And you can see that already here we found the inbound message callback in the ARI host RTQ. So this is the thing here. And we can also see uh, the shared library where this comes from. And there is obviously a lot more going on in Com Center and a lot more puzzles. Uh, but yeah, so this really helps in locating things. Here you can see another example for the Bluetooth daemon. This is executed on an iPhone 11, which has a PCI Express based chip. The backtrace also shows that this came via IOKit. Let's continue with the cross process communication. XPC is the mechanism for daemons to talk to other daemons, and also used by apps. Information might be forwarded using XPC even if the developer is not really aware of this, for example, when using frameworks that interact with daemons. XPC has a strict permission system based on the underlying map ports. The launch daemon manages this. There are two open source implementations to look into XPC, and one is based on native code and the other one uses Frida. The Frida script is super simple to run, and the implementation already decodes a lot of XPC binary formats to somewhat more human readable outputs. Note that it's still a lot of data that is printed, so it's usually a bit confusing. Even worse, on targets like Com Center, it often crashes after a few moments because the target runs into memory limits. So let's take a look into the Bluetooth daemon using XPC Spy. So as you can see, there are some messages being exchanged um, and some of this is also decoded here. So if this is a dictionary, you can get somewhat readable output here. And you can also see the name uh, and there are also process IDs, etc. They are not resolved by the script, but you can check what process 
it is using the PS uh, locally on the iPhone. The reason why you cannot easily run XPC Spy on Comp Center is that it uses XPC a lot. When fuzzing Comp Center in the baseband interface, as I presented at the RC3, I managed to crash 12 external demons. So be aware that XPC is very powerful and might even be used to escalate privileges. Using XPC, you can use regular programs to interact with demons. For example, Comp Center has an interface for SMS testing. You can check out Natalie's example. It works with native code and is not based on Frida. This test functionality for SMS was probably invented because SMS are a great target for serial click remote code execution. SMS are well tested and have a lot of debug prints within Com Center. Note that processing SMS via the XPC interface will skip a few baseband related functions, so it's still a bit different. When talking about hardware, we still need to dig a bit deeper and look into IOKit and Mach. IOKit is a framework that enables access to functions in the kernel. For this, IOKit drivers in the kernel define methods that are exported, including their parameter types. This means that some verification takes place. It is not possible to call arbitrary functions with invalid arguments in the kernel. This is still super useful to interact with hardware. It is possible to spawn a new user client, but most of the time, the easiest way is to inject something into a user client that is already running within a daemon. Here you can see the output of a script that first determines all user clients in a process and then prints all function call arguments. In this example, the nearby daemon has two relevant user clients that interact with the ultra chip. The other Apple Key Store user client has a different purpose and is used by almost every daemon. Below you can see the first IO connect call method call within the IOKit framework. The selector defines the index of the S method of the user client that will be called. To get this mapping, you need to reverse engineer the kernel. And in our case, the S method at index 3 is called X perform command method. More reverse engineering would reveal that input 28 is mapped to the application processor check-in. While the details are still a lot of work to reverse engineer, this might be sufficient for fuzzing, and you should see some protocol internals in raw byte format. All right, let's try this on the nearby daemon. So here it starts, and as you can see, we get the user clients, and the SPU user client regularly gets this hex28 input, and that's it. And now I will also start sharing something in AirDrop. Um, and as you can see, this causes a lot of other calls, including a longer configuration here. And more about this format and what it does, I'm going to tell at the Black Hat and DEF CON talk about the U1 chip. Note that not all kernel interaction is implemented using IOKit. You can double check if you missed something by intercepting the underlying format used for all kernel interaction, Mach messages. However, there are a lot of Mach messages. Even XPC messages are just Mach messages in the end. You should at least filter out XPC messages, which you can easily do by filtering all messages that start with at XPC. And with this, let me conclude this talk. In this talk, I have shown that you can find chip interfaces using IOKit and the underlying Mach messages. You can identify protocol handlers quite fast using GCD. Proprietary protocol details are often contained in debug logs. You just need to read, or you can reverse engineer shared libraries with symbols. If you want to inject custom payloads, you can also call functions using Frida, and often interesting functions are also callable via XPC. If you have further questions, you can always drop me a DM or write me an email.